so today we're going to do two topics that are related to each other, um, both in the atmosphere, both pollution. One is addition of acid oxides and the formation of acid rain. And the other one is photochemical smog in um, tropospheric ozone, which effectively come from the same sorts of processes. It's just a question of whether we have a dry or wet atmosphere. So the same reading as I mentioned last time and the week before, um, chapters 8, 10, 12, and 13. And so for about the first half day, we're going to talk about acid oxides um, and how they get into the atmosphere. It contributes to acid rain and some of the variations around the globe and how this is happening and what is happening. And then we'll switch to talking about um, photochemical smog and tropospheric ozone production, which is different than the stratospheric ozone depletion we talked about last time. <clears throat> so the first topic, acid oxides and acid pollution in the atmosphere. Um, this is primarily loading of nitrogen and sulfur in the atmosphere by human activities. And the textbook is really good in talking about the chemical reactions. So I'm going to summarize it, but I'm going to go into a detail. In them. What the textbook isn't so good on is describing trends um, around the country and around various parts of the world in terms of who's adding acid oxides now, who added them in the past, and um, how is it varying in time. So that's the stuff that we're going to look at, as well as some of the consequences of adding acid. That, so this is a diagram with pH across the top. I don't know if you can see it, but 6.5, 6, 5.5, 5.0, 4.5, showing you for a whole bunch of different aquatic organisms, their sensitivity to CO2. And I've added on here the lower CO2 endpoint, which is sort of, you know, these are half scales, but it's somewhere in between that uh, three, um, I mean, excuse me, the, the um, five and 4.0 4 box, approximately. Um, and so biological systems, for the most part, especially microfauna, have evolved to be within the CO2 range set by carbon dioxide. That's a standard. And um, many organisms have extreme sensitivity to acid that's even just a little bit below um, what we expect to find naturally in the hydrosphere. And as you can see here, there are some resilient species, but pretty much everything is done by about that cannot exist below that lower um, CO2 endpoint. So anytime we find pH in the environment that's less than that, we know that there was some other acid that was added. And those acids can have to be mineral acids, like nitric or sulfuric acid, or they can be organic acids. And the focus for today is going to be entirely on mineral acids. These are just some other benchmarks of some other things that have similar acidities to various places on that pH scale. <clears throat> so this is a summary diagram from a different textbook showing you what might be the ingredients in an acid rate. Now, acid rain can either be primarily sulfuric or nitric. It's rarely primarily hydrochloric acid. Sometimes we see a little bit in there. This is like a hypothetical thing. But if you recall back to when we talked about rain and we talked about doing the budgets for the marine elements and the terrestrial elements, if, for instance, we see a lot of sulfate and it is balanced by magnesium, then we can imagine that that's probably coming from sea salt. Or if it's balanced by calcium, is coming from gypsum or calcium sulfate in a terrestrial environment. And in those two instances, the high amount of sulfate would not be associated with a high amount of acid. In an acid rain, an acidic rain situation like this, the presence of either or both of these two things with a lot of free uh, hydrogens and not so much calcium or magnesium. Um, pretty much indicates that there's been an anthropogenic or natural source of sulfur or an anthropogenic source of nitrogen. There really aren't um, any sufficient natural sources of nitrogen oxides to cause nitric acid rain naturally, but there are some sources of sulfur, and we'll talk about what those are in a moment. <clears throat> there are also obviously other things in the rain. There are particulates that um, come in the dust size fraction, and some of them can act as bases um, immediately, like magnesium and calcium carbonate, or more um, subtly over time to dissolution processes and um, incongruent reactions, but they don't significantly contribute to the change of pH in the rain. So we're going to look at sulfur, and then we'll look at nitrogen. Um, 
in order. And so these are the three main sources of sulfur that we find in our atmosphere. And I want to say that human activities, and we'll see this in a second, have produced so much in this category that these other two categories end up not being all that important. They're like a factor of 10 lower. They weren't important until humans started combusting fossil fuel. But especially when we do coal and diesel fuel, we load tons of sulfur into the atmosphere. There are various biogenic production of various organosulfur bearing compounds, the most common of which is DMS, um, which is primarily made by marine phytoplankton. There are other uh, products, similar products that are made by terrestrial plants, and it degrades in the atmosphere by reaction with hydroxyl radicals, which we've talked about before, to be oxidized to uh, SO2. There are also volcanic sources, as is, we all know when we have foggy days here, Kilauea and to a much lesser extent Mauna Loa put out sulfur whether they're erupting or not. There's more sulfur when they're erupting than when they're not. They're primarily the oxidized forms. You get a small amount of reduced sulfur as well. But locally, these can be very significant. They are significant here, but on a global scale, except when we're having a very intense volcanic episode, um, they aren't all that important. So what's important about sulfur is, is that no matter what form it goes into the atmosphere, it's oxidized. And it's oxidized pretty easily into SO2. Then SO2 can be further oxidized into SO3, which dissolves in water to make sulfuric acid. And this happens by various kinds of oxidants in the atmosphere, whether the hydroxyl radicals or hydrogen peroxide or oxygen atoms, um, things that we have done to enhance the oxidizedness of the atmosphere contribute to the rate of that um, being faster. So um, sulfur in this form is a particulate. It's a kind of a bluish particulate. It looks like a blue gas, but it's a very fine particulate. It can dissolve in water to make sulfuric acid, or if it's a very dry atmosphere, it just stays as particulates, which make aerosols, which can move higher up in the atmosphere and are important for um, cloud nucleation. So this is a summary of the chemical reactions. And what you'll see is these first three just show you so SO2 reacting with the three oxidants I've already mentioned, hy uh, hydroxyl radicals, hydrogen peroxide, and ozone to make SO3. The one difference is, is that in these two reactions, we go directly to sulfuric acid. In this reaction, we go to SO3, which then dissolves in water if it's present in sulfuric acid. The various reduced forms of sulfur, like hydrogen sulfide or DMS or dimethyl sulfone, as this stuff is. Um, will also react with the same three oxidants as up here and end up making some SO3 and some SO2, the ultimate fate being making SO3. So pretty much anything you put in the atmosphere is going to make SO3. Uh, this is a strong acid. So this first acid dissociation happens at a pKa that has a negative value. It's essentially completely dissociated in most uh, media in um, aqueous media. And the second um, dissociation is pretty strong as well. So it's a strong acid. So this plot summarizes some of the sources from the oceans, from the land, and from human activities of sulfur to the atmosphere. I think the key thing to get out of this is that there are biogenic sources, there are volcanic emissions. Um, biogenic sources can come from marine and terrestrial organisms. Um, and there are anthropogenic emissions. And as I've already said, these are the lion's share of the emissions by far, by a factor of 10 greater. But the main fate of any sulfur compound, whether it's coming out of the biosphere or it's coming out of a volcano or whatever, is to get oxidized. <clears throat> it's going to get oxidized in a series of steps. And in the presence of water, it will dissolve in the water and make sulfuric acid. And in a very dry atmosphere, we will get sulfate particles, which can contribute to various other reactions in the atmosphere. This is a couple of diagrams showing you fluxes in reservoirs. <clears throat> this one up here might be you know, a little bit more intuitive because it's got, got graphics associated with it, but the numbers are basically the same as these, which I find easier to read. So this is fluxes coming from the land to the atmosphere. This is the flux is coming from the ocean to the atmosphere. Those are up arrows, down arrows are obviously going in the reverse. If you remember when we talked about the hydrologic cycle, water transmits from the ocean to the atmosphere over the continents, over the um, land, and then it rains out, and the cycle is completed by runoff. 
so that there's a net transfer of water from the oceans to the land in the gas phase and then a return that's runoff. And that's presumably how the sulfur cycle also worked until human activities. But the human activities work differently. If you just look at the um, arrows here, the transfer between air over oceans and air over continents, we put more in this direction and it's coming back by something like approximately a factor of three. And so you can go in here and look at each of the various amounts of sulfur and um, which are given in teragrams of sulfur per year. I've just converted them into percents to make it easier for you to see. And you will see all the various things that we've already talked about. There's volcanic sulfur, there's the biogenic sulfur, there's a small amount of dry deposition, there's dissolved sulfate, there's um, the fossil fuel sulfur, as you can see here, accounts for about 50% of the total cycle. There's also biomass burning, which is a natural process, but something that we have greatly enhanced through processes of deforestation, especially in tropical areas in recent decades. And so this number is probably a lot higher than it used to be, but it's still small compared to this, right? 2% versus 47%. You can see here that the lion's share of the sulfur that does deposit in the oceans, because we do have a net flux this way, comes out as dissolved sulfate ion or dry deposition when the atmosphere is dry. There are a couple of these fluxes out of the ocean, sea salt, cyclic salt, which we've talked about before, and DMS production, but um, they end up being swamped out by this flux, which if you can see here, pretty much just balances this flux. So in a pre-human activities period of time when we weren't loading the atmosphere with sulfur due to fossil fuel burning, um, we would expect this was smaller and this was small. But we don't actually have measurements from that period of time to be able to see that. So this isn't a universal flux everywhere on the globe. There are latitudinal variations. So this is latitude going north. The south, the equator is uh, somewhere like right here. It's not lateral, but it's between three north and three south. And this is up to 100%. So this is not telling you the net flux. This is just telling you the relative proportion of anthropogenic, biogenic, and volcanic. And you can see that in the temperate region, northern latitude, anthropogenic uh, sulfur is something like 90% of the total. Human activities are dominating the flux in the temperate region where most of the industrialization and transportation happens on the planet. And in other regions of the globe, it's more split. It's, unless you get very far south where there's very little human habitation, you always have some anthropogenic impact, but you've got the biogenic and the volcanic. And interestingly enough, there's more volcanism that puts sulfur into the atmosphere in this region kind of closer to the equator than there is in extreme uh, south. And that just happens to do with where the land happens to be and where the processes that allow for volcanism happen to be. So this is another look at sulfur from the biological perspective. So I think we all recognize that sulfur is an important biological element. There are amino acids based on sulfur. There are other important proteins uh, based on sulfur in uh, the human body and other organisms. And when organisms grow in an environment, they take sulfur in, they convert it to various organic forms, and then when they die, that sulfur is released in either inorganic forms or organic forms, whose fate is to go into the atmosphere and to be oxidized. So it doesn't really matter what form it comes in as. If it comes as DMS straight from the atmosphere, great. It's going to interact with hydroxyl radicals or ozone or hydrogen peroxide to make SO2 and then ultimately dissolve in water to make H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. And these sulfuric acid rain dissolves with the rest of the, part of the water in the atmosphere and contributes to acid rain. You can also have some amount of this stay as dry aerosols and contribute to cloud nuclei and various other chemical reactions, such as we talked about the interaction of having active surfaces for, with sulfates and the uh, destruction of ozone with blast. So um, really in the end, even though there are some natural sources of sulfur and there's some reduced sulfur that comes out of volcanoes and some oxidized sulfur, the fate of all the sulfur in the atmosphere is to be oxidized. It oxidizes really easily in the troposphere. And so um, that's how we get so much acid rain from that sulfur. And this is the volcanic source. These are a couple pictures of Kilauea. This is Kilauea um, in April of 2008, right after the lava lake of Halemau had opened up for the first time in 
several decades. And it was um, not erupting vigorously. So it was sending up a plume of gases. And this is primarily CO2, which you don't get to see with your naked eye. The particulate is a combination of water vapor and sulfur. And this is rising up only a couple um, hundred to uh, perhaps about 500 meters above the crater rim. So something less than a kilometer total. During periods of eruption, it can be pushed much higher up in the atmosphere. I'll show you an example in a two in a second. But the key point is because of the trade winds and because of the sort of constant degassing that's happening of sulfur, we get in the kind of downwind area of the cotton desert. Cotton desert is complicated. It's a desert in part because we go over from the windward to the leeward side. And so there's naturally a rain gradient as well. But the contributing over long periods of time, the acid oxides has contributed to the land looking very different than it would in the absence of an active volcano. Now, this is what it looks like when sulfur goes high in the atmosphere. This is Mount Pinatubo. This is part of the Pliny interruption that happened in 1991. It sent sulfur very high to the atmosphere, spread around the entire planet. We see it deposited in the polar ice sheets, for instance, a little spike of sulfuric acid along with volcanic particles. And this kind of sulfur that goes up high enough into the atmosphere that it goes beyond the troposphere into the stratosphere, most of that doesn't dissolve in water to make acid rain. The sulfur that goes up into the stratosphere, which is relatively dry, makes dry aerosols, which contribute to our albedo. So we see short-term cooling. It also contributes to ozone destruction. So we saw some short-term ozone loss associated with that. And the fraction of the sulfur that stays in the stratosphere, I mean, excuse me, in the troposphere, contributes to rain acidity. This is just a picture, a satellite image showing you, and that's, that's where Pinatubo is, it's the Philippines all around here, showing you this volcanic plume moments after the eruption happened. This is a plume that they were able to track is going entirely around the globe. And so distributing sulfur far and wide. Now the anthropogenic sources of sulfur are primarily fossil fuel, but not exclusively. Okay, and this is a, a table, it's relatively old, it's from the mid 80s, sort of showing you where the sulfur, how much sulfur was being used in teragrams just in the US. Um, US's numbers have gone down, but globally, especially China's numbers have way eclipsed these, um, as we'll see in a second in global trends. But you can see that the breakdown in the US before we started doing emissions controls and looking for cleaner sources was primarily electricity generation coal-fired plants, and to a lesser extent, diesel. Don't let anyone ever tell you there's anything called clean coal. There's nothing called clean, really clean coal. There's more uh, dirty and slightly less dirty. And as time has gone on, we've used most of the really not as dirty coal. And things that coal is dirty with are sulfur, mercury, and uh, various other heavy metals. And so um, it's a major source of sulfur in the atmosphere. There's also heating, there's some amount of industry, smelting and refining, think about, you know, jewelry and all the metals from your phone, for instance. Um, many of them release sulfur because they come in the earth and mineral forms that are associated with sulfur. <clears throat> and then some odds and ends of other things. And so, you know, fossil fuel burning is the primary source and the occurrence of sulfur in fossil fuels is, you know, the original biological matter, the biogenic material that makes up the coal had sulfur in it, but when it gets uh, genocized and made into coal, the sulfur is usually associated with pyrene. So in the very high temperatures that were burning the carbon, the CO2, we're also burning this stuff to make the SO2 directly. So this is kind of what that chemical reaction looks like. It's obviously a redox reaction. We're oxidizing the carbon, we're oxidizing the sulfur, and we're producing oxidized carbon, oxidized sulfur, and oxidized iron in the process. And different amounts of coal um, and to a less percent diesel fuel have varying amounts of this. So per BTU um, or other, you know, per joule of energy released, you can get more or less sulfur. And as time has gone on, we've used dirtier and dirtier forms of sulfur from this source. Now, the original source of sulfur to the atmosphere, when it was recognized in the 50s, was in parts of northwestern Europe and the northeastern United States. 
that's when we first started to say, hey, maybe something's going on here with the atmosphere and lower pHs were first measured. And over the ensuing decades, and it's been painful, but over the ensuing decades, there have been emissions controls that have helped reduce the sulfur loading. Part of it is switching to other forms of electricity generation. Part of it is using cleaner versions of coal. Part of it is smokestack controls to capture the sulfur where it's being produced so that um, the flux has at least stabilized and, just, and in some places it's gone down. Unfortunately, globally, the SO2 from this source is still rising. And after we talk about climate change, we're going to talk about energy. And what we find is that carbon-based forms of energy are relatively inexpensive. So even though they're terrible for the atmosphere and super contaminating, they're still being used. And countries like India and China especially are the ones that account for most of the sulfur loading of the atmosphere. In the US and in Europe, when this first recognition of sulfur loading and acid rain production came online, essentially what we did is switch our acid production from sulfur to nitrogen. We'll talk about nitrogen next. So it's not like we're still not loading uh, acids into the atmosphere, but it's a, it's a slightly different answer. So this is some plots over um, the United States of sulfate concentration is color coded. The concentration scale is the same here. It's a time series, 1997, oh, excuse me, 94, 97, 2000, 2002. Green is relatively low concentration. Orange is relatively high concentration. Yellow is somewhere in between. And I think it doesn't take much to see that the area of high sulfate concentration that was present in the early 90s has diminished significantly by the year 2002. There are still much more sulfur going into the atmosphere in the Northeast than there is over two thirds of the country, you know, sort of in the West, West of the Great Lakes. And this entire region doesn't contribute very much, um, but it has improved. And that's largely through the kinds of emission controls I was talking about. <clears throat> so now let's talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen is a little bit more complicated. So, whereas for sulfur, we have all these natural sources of sulfur in the atmosphere. Um, and their ultimate phase is to become oxidized and dissolve in the water. We don't have very much nitrogen in our atmosphere that isn't N2. Almost all of it is, right? The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen and is very stable in that form. You can make nitrogen oxides by burning nitrogen with heat. That means sort of lightning strikes or very intense forest fires. It's a really small amount of sulfur, but it does happen. And we make various oxidation states which we abbreviate as NOx. That just means nitrogen with some amount of oxygen. You know, so you'll see NOx on a lot of slides. And that just means one of these forms, NO, N2O, NO2, or N2O. So when we take any one of these forms that is less than the maximum oxidation, which happens to be NO2, we react them with those same three oxidants that we talked about for sulfur, hydroxyl radicals, hydrogen peroxide, or ozone, and we make them into NO2. So for instance, this is the example of NO making NO2. And um, it would be the same with any of the other products. The stoichiometry is a little bit different, but the ultimate fate through multiple steps is to make NO2. Now the complicated thing about nitrogen that humans have changed dramatically is the fact that we put a lot of nitrogen in its non-allotropic form, in one of these forms, into the atmosphere during fossil fuel combustion. So you imagine the very high temperature that required in a gasoline-powered combustion engine to burn the hydrocarbons also burns nitrogen through nitrogen oxides. It causes this reaction to happen. So that, for the most part, when we put nitrogen into the atmosphere, we put nitrogen in the atmosphere in one of these oxidized forms. It can be any one of these NOxes, but the way uh, cars that have gasoline or carburetors or fuel injectors are typically run is to make slightly less oxidized forms of nitrogen. And they're produced along with unburned fossil fuels, which we abbreviate as VOC, volatile organic carbon compounds. They're mostly hydrocarbons, but other kinds of VOCs in the environment, and we'll see these can be the things emitted by plants and trees, can contribute to the VOC content in the atmosphere. Now, it turns out through a relatively complicated bit of photochemistry, which we'll talk about in the second um, part today when we uh, switch over to talking about photochemical smog, the presence of nitrogen with volatile organic carbon 
um, and light causes photochemical reactions which oxidize um, both the nitrogen and the VOC. And as I say, we'll see that later. But through a series of chemical reactions, the main point is that however nitrogen gets into the atmosphere in a form other than N2, its ultimate fate is much like sulfur. It's going to be oxidized and it's going to dissolve in water to make uh, sulfuric acid, right? Or excuse me, nitric acid. So um, there can also be associations between nitrates and sulfates um, that make compound particles and uh, but help contribute to the amount of sulfuric acid that ends up being produced from the sulfur loading. But this is kind of a secondary to the primary process, which is the oxidation and the dissolution in water. So we've talked before that there aren't very many non-allotropic sources of nitrogen in the atmosphere, and there are very few of these uh, acid oxide sources that are not human. There's a small amount of biogenic ammonium that gets added to the atmosphere in temperate region, very wet forests. But again, it's a really localized and not very uh, large flux. So the anthropogenic uh, NOx source is the primary source. It far outweighs the others, even more so than for sulfur. Internal combustion is the main um, association. And a lot of this nitrogen oxide goes into the atmosphere in a complicated way during the internal combustion process, along with ozone and volatile organic carbon. So it's a little bit more complicated chemistry. And you can see here, this is a table that sort of shows you all the different environmental things that nitrogen in various forms, gaseous forms, is involved in. We're focused on NOx, which is here, but you know, N2O, which we'll talk about um, next time, is involved in uh, global warming. We've already talked about its role in stratospheric ozone depletion. You can see some various roles for ammonia, but for the nitrogen oxides, we're talking about uh, acid rain right now. We're going to talk about photochemical smog. And even in a more diffuse sense, it can just contribute to the oxidizedness of the troposphere, which contributes to other kinds of photochemistry going on. So this is a plot of nitrogen oxide around the world from 1975 to 1994. And these are concentrations. And you can see that the concentrations are going up very substantially. <clears throat> so unlike SO2, the um, you know inputs of nitrogen oxide to the atmosphere are more evenly distributed. SO2 you know, is coming out of power plants, coal burning plants, um, to some extent out of homes and, and other things too. They're using those things for heat generation, but a lot of the SO2 is industrial and sort of more point source, whereas the nitrogen oxide is coming from everyone who's got a car that isn't powered by a battery. And so, um, interestingly enough, you know, people always like to talk about how polluted the air is in certain cities in the West, like Denver and LA, but it turns out that 80% of the sulfur oxides and 65% of the nitrogen oxides are produced in this country east of the Mississippi. It's really the eastern seaboard which is contaminating the atmosphere. So this is a series of plots now for nitrogen. It's just like the plot that I showed you for sulfur, where we're looking at um, you know, red colors being high, green colors being low, 1994 to the year 2000. It's not as dramatic, but I think you can still see that there was more nitrogen in the atmosphere here in the form of, of various oxides that dissolve in water to make nitrate relative to here. <clears throat> and this is kind of reflective of the fact that the country um, and as has East, uh, Western Europe, switched from less sulfur bearing fuel to more nitrogen producing fuel, um, which means coal to gasoline. So the other kind of acid oxide that we find in the atmosphere is much less common, but in very localized places, we can find fluorine in the atmosphere to release either as Cl2 or as hydrochloric acid directly. You know, chlorine is involved in the production of some polymers like PVC. And so in a localized area, there's certain parts of the south around where the Mississippi River runs through Louisiana, where, for instance, there's a lot of industrial processes that um, emit uh, hydrochloric acid into the atmosphere or chlorine into the atmosphere, which is oxidized and can make uh, various, um, you know, either HCl or HOCl. So this happened, but they're really not. They're just worth a footnote. So 
Um, these are a series of diagrams, time series, 1956, 1974, 1985, showing you the evolution of rain peach as a series of contours over Northern Europe between this time period. So you can see here that there's this area of rain peach, 4.7, it's already quite low, lower than one would anticipate, showing up in the 50s. And then by the 70s, this peach has gotten really low, lower than that lower CO2 endpoint. So we know for sure it's mineral acid. The contour has expanded, and uh, especially to cover areas over land. This is pretty much just over the North Sea. And then by um, the year 1985, it's expanded even further <clears throat> and, and migrated over the land. And this was um, a series of recognitions. This came out in a paper that was published in 1979 about the genesis of acid rain and the understanding, but it was really sort of in this period between the sort of late 50s and 70s when along with lots of other environmental problems that we've already talked about, phosphate loading, ozone destruction, that people first became aware of this as an issue and started making rain measurements more globally and then enacting policies to try and change that. So this is the same set of plots for the United States. And we're pretty much only showing the northeastern part of the U.S. in these two plots. It's the only place where we measured perturbations. But the rain was even worse. The bill wasn't first recognized here. It was first recognized in Europe, but very soon thereafter it was measured here. It was already a very big area covering the entire northeastern um, seaboard, much of New England, all of the mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania and New York being right there in the center. 4.4 is already pretty low pH. You can see now the smallest uh, or tightest contour were down to 4.1. And this now, all of a sudden, this whole area below 4.1, um, significantly lower pH than we can make by putting carbon oxide in the water. <clears throat> so this is some other data about CO2, I mean, of SO2, excuse me, and NOx usage. So up here are a series of measurements by year. This is 1965 to 1980 of sulfate ions and nitrate ions in water um, in a lake in upstate New York, a place called Pink Lake. And it's basically showing you that you can see the sulfur concentration slowly going down. And remember, we have to take into account the fact that there's a significant residence time of sulfate anions in water. Even if we shut off the source, the concentration in the lake is not going to go down right away. But it is going down, and nitrate is going up at the same time. Both of those things come into the environment when we find them in a lake in a form that um, also add hydrogen ions. So the pH of these lakes have been going down, although to some extent, some of the acid is used um, to neutralize soil particles. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the usage of sulfur and nitrogen in the United States starting in sort of World War II era, going to 1990. And you can see that there was sort of like a peak and then a fall after World War II, then it rose up again. 50s and 60s, and then it declined to the 70s and 80s. And that was because of the recognition of this kind of trend and the association with sulfur. But at the same time, the nitrogen oxide usage is going up. This is a similar plot of equivalent in the UK. So this is, it doesn't show nitrogen, it only shows sulfur, but it's showing you the urban sulfur levels between the mid 60s and the late 80s. Uh, the total energy use over that period is constant but there's been a kind of a, a rise in the use of natural gas, which burns at a much lower temperature and has much less sulfur in it to start out with. And because it burns at a relatively low temperature, it actually doesn't make a huge amount of nitrogen oxides either. And so this is essentially the same kind of pattern. You can find that in Western Europe, you can find that in North America. And um, this is a diagram, more recent diagram from a paper just a couple of years ago, showing you the associations of a whole bunch of different things that are associated with fossil fuel burn. One thing are organic aerosols, um, small particulates and volatile organic carbon. We've got the sulfate plus the nitrate plotted together. So you can see both of those things are going down as is inorganic uh, aerosol, um, you know, uh, things that come out of the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and then black carbon, which are mostly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon monoxide, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about carbon monoxide when we get to talking about smog. But you can see all of these things are being reduced 
in the United States as the way organic matter is being burned, the type of organic matter that's being burned, and emissions controls, things like catalytic converters and stuff, have gone uh, into place. And this would be a really encouraging thing if the rest of the world were looking like this. Like everything's kind of going down, but the rest of the world isn't looking like that, <clears throat> unfortunately. So this is a series of plots for the US now of rain pH. It's the same thing. Red is um, lower pH, green is higher pH. And so you can see that the net effect from going from uh, you know the late night or mid 90s into the early 2000s is that the pH has gotten less acidic in the Northeast. It is still acidic. And you know, you go out there in the rain there or the snow, and acidic material is falling in the world, right? It's pretty low pH, it's pH 4.7, 4.6, 4.8 is common all over. The really low pHs, 4.3s and below, are fairly restricted, whereas here they were fairly common. Most of this bright orange color is less than 4.3. So you can see it covers pretty much all of New York and most of Pennsylvania, all of Ohio, um, you know, significant. So it's gotten better and it's gotten better through conscious effort. So these are global trends. These are, you know, plots from a textbook that came out about 20 years ago, but they show you the same sort of thing that from World War II up till close to the end of the century, the amount of sulfur on the globe production was rising. And the same thing with the nitrogen. So whereas in the U.S. our nitrogen was increasing and our sulfur was decreasing starting in the 50s, globally that's not the case. And so you might say, oh, well, you know, that, was, that was a long time ago. How is it now? It's like, okay, well, here's, here's some more recent data. And this comes from a paper um, from 2011. This showing you the global production of SO2 really reaching a peak and then starting to kind of decline a little bit. And that, that decline or flattening out, you might call it, is because of the efforts made in the United States and Northern Europe to diminish the production of, of SO2. So here's the plot of the United States. And you can see all this kind of complicated activity earlier in the century, but then starting you know, around 1970 or so, it really going down. It would be the same for Northwestern Europe, it would be the same for um, Canada. But then look at this plot here, this is China. And you can see that it's very rapid increase. People like to talk about China um, as a recent player, and that's probably true with carbon dioxide sort of since the year 2000. They put in more carbon dioxide than all the rest of the countries on the planet did in a couple hundred years beforehand. But for sulfur, they had been building their sulfur contribution in the atmosphere over a much longer period of time. It's because they use a lot of electricity. They generate most of their electricity with coal, and they use very um, dirty kind of first and second generation steam uh, boilers, which you know use very, very dirty forms of coal. And so, um, and, and, and you would see a similar plot if I had one for India, which I don't. Not as extreme, not as many, um, these are gigatons or gigagrams, I guess I should say, of, of sulfur. There's huge quantities. And so the, you can see here the scales on these are the same. So any reduction here is being offset by increase there. So that this is why globally we see this trend of sulfur you know, rising, perhaps um, you know, not as quickly in recent years. And this is kind of the breakdown from that um, same paper, well, where, where's the sulfur coming from? You know, and about half of it comes from coal and maybe another 20% or so comes from the burning of other fossil fuels. You can see that metal smelting is a pretty significant, that's that purple swath, pretty significant thing. Um, you know, it's behind these two higher carbon sources, but even if we change our energy consumption practices on the planet to use less carbon or even eradicate these, we're probably not going to eradicate this. And so, but that's a really, if that's all we were loading into the atmosphere, it would probably be okay. And you can see some of these other categories like international shipping, ships use a particularly dirty kind of fuel when they're out at sea. When they're near shore, they're, they switch to kind of more traditional stuff. But when they're out at sea, they use this really very dirty uh, stuff. And you can see, you know, there's some natural sources like grasslands and forest fires is this kind of light green, it's, it's on there. Sulfur waste in various forms is on there. Biomass burning is on there, but barely detectable. It's like this little beige color that shows up on, on peaks. It's really coal and petroleum. So 
you know, just uh, last couple of minutes about acid rain. It has various impacts on the environment. It has a biological impact, as I showed you with that picture at the very beginning, because uh, most organisms are not evolved to live at pH is significantly less than a lower CO2 endpoint. And so we see lots of impacts in aquatic ecosystems, and terrestrial ecosystems, um, receiving a lot of acid rain. There are also all sorts of geological and chemical impacts. Imagine, for instance, um, materials that can dissolve in the presence of acid are going to do that, and that's going to liberate ions into solution and create create more saltiness. It's also going to replace cations and cation exchange sites on clay minerals, meaning that clay minerals and soils are not able to hold as much potassium or ammonium, and so the fertility goes way down. Um, and this is just um, a plot showing you, um, as of around the turn of the century, sort of four things. <clears throat> soils are sensitive to acid emissions, which are defined as having a CEC that's um, less than six, and soils that are sort of between 15 and six are sort of sensitive. And so, you know, think about the processes through which soils are formed, the clay particles with high or low CEC are formed, and where you find them, the sensitive soils tend to be in um, places with a lot of rainfall, tropical or temperate regions. <clears throat> and also shown, so those are areas in gray, areas in blue are areas that were receiving acid emissions at the time of this diagram, focused acid emissions. Highlighted in yellow are the, the areas that were a problem around Y2K, and in red were areas that were presumed to be going to be problems next. And by this point in time, we had the northeastern United States, we had Western Northern Europe, and we had China. And then, you know, starting to see problems in various other areas. And in fact, that has kind of come, come to fruition, including other places on the planet for their issues as well. <clears throat> this is just a plot of the concentration of aluminum concentration as a function of pH in two places, lakes in the Adirondacks and seawater off the west coast of Sweden. So it turns out that again, aluminum solubility, aluminum is a pretty toxic metal to many organisms, but its solubility is really limited by pH. So around the pHs that we find in the CO2 endpoint, aluminum is not very soluble. You can go look back when we had our water treatment uh, lecture where I talked about the adding of aluminum and the need to either lower pH or raise pH to make particulates to flocculate out. There isn't very much aluminum in water, but when you acidify, you start to increase the aluminum by orders of magnitude. So you can see here, these are concentrations of you know, 0.01, 0.1, and 1 is a log scale against pH. And where the waters are high, or excuse me, low in pH, high in acidity, they have very high concentrations of aluminum, which have toxic impacts on aquatic organisms in those ecosystems. So there's just a couple of other kind of negative effects of acid rain, which have to do with you know, affecting the cycle of carbonate minerals, organic substances, which when they are deprotonated, they can chelate metals and make them uh, bioavailable in soils and waters, et cetera, and clay minerals, as I just mentioned, for the CEC. So when we add a lot of acids to them, we protonate those things, and we take away their ability to do all those important processes. <clears throat> That's just an example of, you know, for some people, acid rain, the biggest impact was the destruction of like statues in Europe and stuff. And I'm not saying it isn't like a thing, an important thing, but um, I would argue it's much more cosmetic than the kinds of impacts that, were, that we just described uh, on the actual environment. Okay, so now this is the other topic today. And this is what we call tropospheric photochemical smog. So as the name implies, this happens in the troposphere as does acid rain. It happens in the presence of light, photochemical, that requires reaction, and is primarily on the basis of nitrogen being at the atmosphere, not so much sulfur. So this one regard is different from acid rain. The other thing that's different is that you need a really dry atmosphere to make photochemical smog. So if this were happening, these processes were happening, emission processes in a wet atmosphere, we would mostly just make acid rain. But the components of photochemical smog go into the atmosphere, there's usually an inversion involved There's some sort of geography that helps keep the gases present, and they react with light. So over the course of several days, 
the smog gets worse. And it varies through the times of the day as the various chemicals go up and down, the reactants and the products, and as the intensity of the light goes up and down. But um, <clears throat> unless something happens to kind of flush the air out, this is Los Angeles on a particularly smoggy day, um, the gases will become trapped and we'll get this thing that we call smog. So um, there's um, kind of complicated set of chemical processes that we're only gonna talk about a little bit because they are rather complicated. But the important thing to note is that there's nitrogen oxides, which are a respiratory irritant. There's ozone that is produced in the photochemical processes. And because this nitrogen is being emitted along with volatile organic carbon compounds, we also make very reactive VOCs. We can make complicated organic nitrogen compounds like the chemical paracetyl nitrate, which we'll talk about is one of them. There's an extreme respiratory irritant and contributes to the reactiveness of the atmosphere. So it's kind of a combination of having light of uh, less than 350 nanometers. And you think back to the discussion we just had last time about ozone, as the ozone layer has thinned and the ability for that layer to filter out ultraviolet light below a certain weight, like more of it comes down to the surface of the earth and can do more damage in the troposphere. And this is, even though the ozone thinning is primarily at the pole, there's a small amount of thinning that happens in temperate regions as well. So that, all things being equal, that just contributes to the amount of photochemical smog we make because we have more of this light. But it's really the combination of the light the nitrogen and the volatile organic carbon compounds, which together in a dry atmosphere lead to the negative impact of photochemical smog. <clears throat> so this is an interesting plot um, during the early days of the peak of the coronavirus. So this is right before, like, you know, early January 2020, and then right after everyone went on lockdown in February. And this is atmospheric N2O, and NO, yeah, NO2, excuse me. Um, that's the stuff that appears brown in the atmosphere. And so you can see that, especially in northern China, associated with Beijing, but over a pretty wide area, also Hong Kong, and to a lesser extent, this is Shanghai over here, um, as you can see on that thing, um, that putting people on lockdown and having them stop driving their cars and having people stop transporting things immediately improves the, the nitrogen. This is something that we have control over, not over long time scales. Over the time scale of a month, we can make it go away. Um, unfortunately, you know, as the pandemic waned, it came back. So these are the chemical reactions. They're similar to the chemical reactions we talked about for nitrogen oxides in making acid rain. But remember, this here we're talking about a dry atmosphere and with volatile organic carbon compounds which are coming out of automobile exhaust. So <clears throat> there's a couple of things that happen. One is, is that um, there's a certain amount of ozone that is, exists as a standing crop in the lower atmosphere, and it is enhanced by the presence of volatile organic carbon compounds and nitrogen. Because remember, there's this balance between production and destruction reactions. And when we make the lower atmosphere more oxidized and more reactive, we tend to increase the standing crop of ozone. And ozone, in the presence of the volatile organic carbon compounds and the nitrogen, makes a bunch of different chemical species. So for instance, ozone with volatile organic carbon compounds, and here, for instance, I've just given you some um, uh, unsaturated hydrocarbon. We don't know how many carbons are hazmate, but if this were just a hydrogen, that would just be ethylene gas. Or if this were one carbon, it would be propylene, two carbons, butylene, et cetera. And the ozone with those things makes aldehydes, which react pretty easily with um, light in the atmosphere to make aldehyde um, radicals, meaning they just lose their hydrogen. They are another fairly reactive species that is produced in the atmosphere. And you can see here that these aldehydes can react further with light to make um, <clears throat> these carbon radicals that are really pretty reactive. So one of the things that they can do is become oxidized to carboxylic acid-like radicals. They're missing their hydrogen. That's what this is. It's RCOO radical, which can react with the nitrogen oxide that are coming from the um, <clears throat> gases and uh, from the fuel emissions and make more oxidized nitrogen 
and slightly more reduced carbon radicals, which can just keep feeding into these uh, set of reactions. We also have carbon monoxide, which is produced in automobile exhaust. This is from the combustion of the carbon, but not complete combustion to CO2. Carbon monoxide is, of course, a very toxic gas. You hear these stories, tragic stories of people using fuel heaters in their home without any kind of um, ventilation, and carbon monoxide can build up and kill people because it's odorless and tasteless. And we put a very small amount out of our automobile exhaust, but enough that it can interact with oxidants in the atmosphere to make CO2 and to make um, hydrogen peroxide radicals, which contributes to the oxidizing this. So when fuel combustion is run <clears throat> to be um, what we call lean, meaning it doesn't produce as much nitrogen oxide because it's burning a little bit less more, we end up making a lot of extra uh, carbon monoxide in that process which can contribute to making the peroxide radicals, which react with the nitrogen oxides anyway to make the most oxidized form. So there's really not very much benefit <clears throat> to kind of tuning down the temperature to try and um, make more carbon monoxide and less nitrogen because you're probably going to get the nitrogen, uh, fully oxidized nitrogen out of it. Anyway. Now there's some other reactions in here, like this one here, which makes this molecule, HC3 is a, is a methyl group. COONO2. It's like COOH, a carboxylic acid, but it's got a nitrate on here. And that's a chemical called uh, peroxyacetyl nitrate or PAN. And this is one of the strongest irritants in smog. So it comes from taking this um, acetyl radical and reacting with NO2. And this is just a little picture of what that molecule looks like. And, you know, it seems like a complicated name. That's the acetyl part. We've talked about acetates before, that's just the um, carboxylic acid part of acetic acid. This is what makes it a um, peroxide. So the peroxyl part in here is this, oxygen binds to an oxygen, and this is just the nitrate. So this is taking the place, this NO3 is taking the place of a hydrogen that would be there in the regular um, carboxylic acid. <clears throat> and this diagram tries to show you um, these were measurements made over Beijing um, about um, almost 10 years ago, sort of showing you how the concentrations of various gases increase in the atmosphere and are related to each other during a smoggy day. And so, for instance, this is a cycle that's kind of explaining how you make PAN, this peroxyacetyl nitrate, from a combination of nitrogen oxides, which are what these little circles are representing, NO, not as oxidized nitrogen, converting to more oxidized nitrogen. And, that, and as we just saw on the last slide, that's related to ozone production in the lower atmosphere. And the various forms of carbon that are emitted from the volatile organic carbon compound. And so <clears throat> this is aldehyde production up there. These are nitrogen, uh, mo most oxidized nitrogen and um, ozone production. And up the center is the peroxyl acetyl nitrate. And this is just like another look at the complicating factors that contribute to making these things in the atmosphere in a dry atmosphere. So in a very dry atmosphere, we also tend to accumulate aerosols and particulates, especially in urban areas, where there's like a lot of particles anyway, which contributes to the reactiveness of the atmosphere. So the nitrogen that goes into the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning is one of those forms of nitrogen. It doesn't have to be NO2. It could be NO or N2O5 or, um, you know, what have you. And, but ultimately, in the presence of light, they get oxidized. They're getting oxidized by the um, per hydroxyl radicals or the ozone, the hydrogen peroxides. And those nitrate particles, plus any sulfate particles we may have emitted into the atmosphere through coal burning um, or other processes that put sulfur in the atmosphere, contribute to making little fine particulate matter. PM 2.5 just means particulate matter less than 2.5 microns, um, which stays aloft in the atmosphere for a long time, allowing these gases to kind of stick onto them, as we talked about a couple of uh, times ago, and interact with each other. So it promotes the reactivity of the atmosphere. And this is also happening in areas where we tend to see more smog and it's promoted by dry atmosphere. So this diagram is the evolution of smog over the day and all the chemicals that are involved in producing smog. You can see they change 
with the time of the day. We need the photochemistry to start to make these strong oxidants and irritants. And so since we don't have light all year round in most places on the planet, um, the concentration of reactants will be sort of low overnight because there's like fewer cars and stuff. And then the cars might start and it might still be dark out. And so we're getting relatively high amounts of reactants. And then as the light comes on, it gets more intense through the morning hours, we start to see the chemical reactions happen. So you can see here that the oxidant, which in this case is peroxyacetyl uh, nitrate, concentrations out of their worst after about noon. The aldehydes peak a little bit earlier, the nitrogen oxides is NO2 peak a little bit earlier, the NO peaks even a little bit earlier because that's from the products is actually coming out of the vehicles. And the non-methane hydrocarbons, that means volatile organic carbon compounds heavier than one carbon, their concentration peaks in the early morning along with the nitrogen oxides, but then it starts to wane as it reacts to make these other chemicals, right? And so this is why smogginess may vary, um, you know, in a place throughout the day. These are just a couple of other plots showing you the relationship between nitrogen oxides, volatile organic carbon compound, and ozone, and a complicated set of chemistry that takes place in the atmosphere as the light comes on that allows for these gases to mix and react and increase the two things which are respiratory irritants and smog, which are the relative amount of ozone and the relative amount of these oxidized um, organic compounds like periacetyl nitrate. This is the stuff we see, the nitrogen oxide, that's the brownish gas. And it, it's not that it's great for you, but um, on a sliding scale, it's probably the least problematic of the contaminants for, as a respiratory contaminant. The ozone and the organic carbon compounds are more. Now, another thing that's interesting is that the drier the atmosphere, the more these gases accumulate. Some of these gases will dissolve in water if water is present, even if, if we're not having rain, if there's some humidity to the atmosphere, or maybe we've got fog or something like that, then you will get some nitrogen removal because it will dissolve in the water. There's nitric gas in the nitrate anions. But the drier the atmosphere, the more intense this uh, phenomenon is. And this is why places that tend to be very smoggy or have periods of time they're smoggy tend to be very dry. They also tend to have physical barriers like mountain ranges around the city, which helps create inversions and keep the air masses stable so that um, these gases can be input and stew and create smog over a multi-day period. This is a diagram that tries to put all the various things together for nitrogen in, an, in the atmosphere with smog being on this side and acid rain being on this side. And really the primary difference being if the atmosphere is wet, then we're gonna dissolve the nitrogen into the water and we're gonna prevent the kinds of reactions that are up here in this box, this is dry transformation. The interaction with the various oxidants in the atmosphere, the production of the aldehydes and the carboxyl radicals, the production of the organic irritants like peroxyacetyl nitrate, et cetera. It's just that whole thing gets cut off by instead oxidizing our nitrogen and dissolving in water and making nitric acid. So, um, and in fact, places that do accumulate smog in their atmosphere um, sort of chronically, um, one of the things that will clear it out is, is a rainstorm because we're just washing that stuff away. So the production of nitrogen oxide during fossil fuel burning is kind of complicated. And um, as is the whole process of fueling your vehicle. So as we've just kind of seen, you kind of need four ingredients to make smog. You need light, you need nitrogen oxide, you need volatile organic carbon compound, and you need a dry atmosphere that will promote the production of the oxidants. So of all those ingredients, the, um, this one here, the, the volatile organic carbon compounds, and one of the things that didn't receive as much attention early on, they started putting catalytic converters in cars in the 80s to try and pull out the last remaining bit of unoxidized um, hydrocarbon from the fuel stream in the exhaust and lower the load. But the idea of every time you put gas in your car and we've all done it, you stand there and you smell it and so forth. And it amazes me that to this day, we don't have vapor recovery in Hawaii. It's just absolutely insane. 
if you go and fuel your car up in a place like California, um, they have a completely different nozzle and a thing that basically makes it so that you can stand right next to the fuel thing when you're fueling it and you won't smell any gas. And it, it maybe doesn't seem like so much for one car, but many, many cars that are, um, when you're fueling them, millions of cars in a place like Los Angeles contributes to the volatile organic carbon compound content of the atmosphere, which ultimately contributes to photochemical smog. It's a pretty easy thing to fix. So this is a plot showing you the sort of air fuel to ratio in gasoline powered cars that either have a carburetor or a fuel injector, showing you that you can balance the relative proportion of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and hydrocarbons by running it, you know, either um, kind of lean or actually, yeah, lean or rich. Um, the problem is, is that if you run it lean, you produce a lot more nitrogen oxide. You do produce more carbon dioxide and you produce less hydrocarbon. But if you run it more rich, you just produce way more hydrocarbon, VOCs into the atmosphere, and the carbon monoxide goes up. And as I showed you on that other slide, if you run it this way, you're getting less fuel economy, which isn't great. Um, but you are you're limiting uh, the amount of nitrogen oxide. But this stuff just reacts in the atmosphere anyway um, to 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 make our nitrogen oxides go up. <clears throat> so there isn't much benefit to changing the relative proportions. This is another plot showing you the volatile organic carbon compounds and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. That contour plot of how much ozone is produced at different mixtures. And what this is telling us is that if we have a lot of VOCs, but not very much nitrogen oxide, we don't get much ozone. If we have very little VOCs and a lot of nitrogen oxide, we don't get much ozone. This kind of like a perfect mix up the middle where if you have roughly one to one proportion of the VOCs and the nitrogen oxides, you get more ozone out of that mixture when it reacts with light. And in fact, we oftentimes, because there have been emissions controls in places that use a lot of petroleum, not Hawaii, but other places, to minimize the VOC that comes from running a, a fueled car, a gasoline fueled car, what we tend to see is, is that the production of nitrogen oxide is relatively high from their burning, but that when you get out into suburban regions around the town that are much more uh, vegetated, and the vegetation can produce its own volatile organic carbon compounds. Just think about aromatic plants and trees. Um, all those compounds count as VOC so that we've already got the um, NO2 concentration and we start to kind of move over into this zone from natural VOCs and we can find smoggier areas in suburbia than in um, the main town. So this is a plot, a global um, assessment of volatile organic carbon compound production. And now here we have to take a step back and recognize that yes, we use VOCs and petroleum, uh, and that is certainly a part of it, but the lion's share of VOC production is the atmosphere is natural, right? Like look, you can see it here over the Amazon, you can see it over certain parts of Africa. Uh, there's um, some production here that's probably not natural in the United States, but VOCs are, are contributed pretty much everywhere. You know, less or more is not so much over Siberia, um, but you know we see pretty deep blues over most of North America and most of South America, much of Africa, much of Australia, much of Western Europe and India and China, so that it really doesn't take um, that much NOx production from fossil fuel burning. And remember, the nitrogen oxide it just comes from the heat. So we have a hot uh, engine that we are combusting our organic carbon to CO2. And as a byproduct, we're also combusting nitrogen and nitrogen oxide. So that, you know, the, the VOCs, yeah, on a localized basis, maybe you can control some of the smog production by limiting um, anthropogenic VOCs. But there are some, certain parts of the world where just naturally there's a lot of VOC and there's not much you can do about it. So these are some measurements of various things in smog. This is ozone on this plot um, concentration in, um, this is over Paris. And these were measurements made in sort of late 1800s, around that, the turn of that century. And then some other measurements that were made between the 50s and the year 2000. And you can see that, um, I mean, we were already in the industrial revolution here. 
And these measurements were probably not great back, you know, 150 years ago, but they're telling us that the concentrations that were measured here were always lower than the concentrations here. Once pretty much everyone has a personal conveyance and is using it to get around, we see these concentrations increasing. They're certainly much worse today than they were back then, but they were already noticeable in the latter part of last century. And this is some um, concentrations of ozone plotted versus altitude in the atmosphere. And just these are averages for different places around the world. This has interstate. So this is Equatorial Pacific, like for instance, us. You don't really see any ozone, you know, very small amounts all the way up through um, the troposphere. This doesn't go into the stratosphere, but we have that other issue we talked about last time. But we have a pretty much standard baseline. This is the Pacific off of South America. The whole thing has a little bit more ozone, but no clear peaks. And now if you look in these two plots, this is um, equatorial Africa in solid, and this is uh, Brazil in dashed line. You'll see those peaks of ozone in the atmosphere. Those are not from fossil fuel burning. Those are from deforestation. That same kind of very intense heat that is produced during the forest fire, a very large one, can make nitrogen oxides. And along with the volatile organic carbon compounds that are being liberated in that process, you can get the production of ozone. This doesn't mean that this is a dominant mechanism for the production of ozone in the troposphere on the planet. That's us. But um, this can happen, again, largely by human activities. And so can it make the air quality pretty bad, even though people aren't driving cars in those places? Okay, so I just have a few more slides. To kind of show you, you know, one of the things that is typically measured to decide how bad is a smoggy day or not is the ozone level. It's a pretty easy thing to measure. It's pretty sensitive. Uh, you can't see it with your eye, but monitors are out. And this was a particularly bad day in 2002, where it was smoggy in California. That's LA. This is the Central Valley, sort of in between the Sierra Nevada and the Coast Ranges. And these are various parts on the eastern seaboard, right? The whole area around DC and up through Philadelphia and to New York, you know, glowing red, as in other areas are too. And so, and these are color coded there by concentration levels, you know, considered unhealthy, moderate, unhealthy, moderate, good. And I, I grew up in Southern California. There were many days where it would basically say, oh, you know, um, the air is unhealthy for everyone or unhealthy for. Most people, like you know, during gym class, we were just told to sit and read a book because they didn't want us breathing too hard. And um, and it's definitely gotten better as we saw from those nitrate plots. Um, but we still do have very bad days, and um, you know it does occur. And the, you have to think about kind of the long term impact. So in a place like California, cars really became dominant part of the culture in the 40s. So we're talking about, you know, maybe 60, 70, 80 years of the cumulative effects of people driving cars and making pollution and contributing to the ozone and the other oxidants and the black carbon and the relative oxidizing of the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. So this is from your text, this is basically showing you places where uh, plant damage has been identified due to smog in California. It, it's, it's a pretty rough um, plot, but you know, makes sense. It's around the urban areas. I have a couple of um, slides from a specific, a specific study done in the San Bernardino Mountains. So if you know your geography of Los Angeles is ringed by mountains, and the San Bernardino Mountains are the tallest. They go up to there's there's a couple of peaks that are around eleven thousand um, feet high, and so is forested. It's, it's really nice. It's a place to go backpacking and stuff. There's um, pretty dramatic landscapes there. And um, yet being adjacent to Los Angeles, it gets its fair share of smog. And so this is was a study that was done um, <clears throat> looking over a multi-year period at the sort of mortality for different kinds of trees, you know, black oak, cedar, a couple of different kinds of pine and fir. And looking at not did the trees die or not, but how did they change in the presence of smog over decades? And so like, this is the number of trees that were present, the number that died, but also the change in the basal area, meaning the area encompassed by the widest part of the canopy of the tree. <clears throat> and, you know, a bunch of different sites up and around Big Bear Lake, which is about 7,000 feet, I think, elevation. 
And this is just some of the details about, you know, someone went out there and measured trees and looked at how many of them were dead or not dead or whatever, and found that there's been probably a change in the species makeup, the community structure in these forests that um, some pines like Ponderosa pine are uh, more at risk than Jeffrey pine, which over decades means it's probably changing the, uh, the nature of the forest. And all the other organisms that might depend on like certain birds will only um, <clears throat> nest in certain kinds of trees, et cetera. So there haven't been as many of these kinds of studies as you might imagine, but irrespective of the impacts on humans, which is I think how we tend to think about smog most of the time, like are we irritated in our lungs or our eyes, whatever, there are also impacts in ecosystem. That's, I just wanted to, to finish up with this. There, you, you can look through these numbers. So some of them, things that are more dramatic than others. There were um, some fairly significant die-offs, like, you know, over the period of the study, something like half the ponderosa pines just uh, up and died and like a third of the oaks died. And part of it is, it's not just the smog, is the smog makes them more susceptible to various kinds of infection by insects, boring beetles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in any event, that's kind of smog in a nutshell. I'm pretty sure that was the last, yeah, last slide. So are there questions about smog or about acid rain? Okay, uh, I'm working on midterms and I'm gonna try to have them, I will have them back by next time uh, for sure. I'm definitely gonna do them. If I don't, I'll try to finish them up this weekend. And I also wanna give you uh, another homework assignment. So I'll be doing that, working on that as well. And that homework assignment will have to do with these atmospheric chapters. 